We'll go back into the book of Ephesians and we'll begin at verse 7. We, we talked about verse 7 last uh, session, but we're going to go back to verse 7 and we'll try to get through verse 10 if nothing happens. Uh, but uh, I tell you what, and I don't know about you, but I enjoyed last week's study. It, it was a blessing to me. But now, uh, in verse 7 it says, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure, which He hath purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times that He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both that are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him. And may God add His blessings to the reading of that precious Word. Last week we talked about God is to be praised for His redemption. God is to be praised for His redemption. Now we're not going to review that, but tonight I want us to go a step further, and I want us to talk about how God is to be praised for the results. God is to be praised for the results of redemption. Now as we begin to think about Him being praised for the results of redemption, uh, the first thing that I want you to notice when we think about that is that the redeemed have been released. The redeemed, they've been released. Now, Paul tells us that the redeemed enjoys, in the latter portion of verse 7, notice what it says, they enjoy the forgiveness of what? Sins. And so, it's through the redemption that we have in Jesus that we can enjoy the forgiveness of our sins. Now the word translated forgiveness here refers to uh, our English, deep English word for pardon. Uh, when it comes to our sins, it basically means our sins have been put away. They've been put away from us as though they had never, ever happened. Boy, I like that, don't you? That our sins has been put away from us as though they had never happened. You see, the word redemption and justification kind of runs together. And uh, we'll talk about justification a little bit later on. But we used to say in seminary that justification simply means this, standing before God, pure, just as though I've never sinned. And that's exactly what redemption does for us. It gives us the right to stand before God just as though we had never sinned. Now, I want you to understand that there is a difference in God's forgiveness and our forgiveness. Now, preacher, what are you talking about? Well, human forgiveness is conditional. Human forgiveness is conditional. Now, someone will hurt us and we struggle to reach a place of forgiveness. Anybody ever been hurt? We, uh, we're human. God understands our humanity. We struggle to reach a place of forgiveness. But when we do reach that place of forgiveness, guess what we don't ever do? We don't ever forget it. We rarely ever forget it. No matter how hard we try, no matter what we do, how hard we may have tried to to forget what's been done to us by the other person, it will always be there. No matter how hard we try to press those memories down, they always seem to float back up to the surface again. Those of you that's been hurt before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And, and that's not how the forgiveness of God works at all. You see, when the Lord forgives, listen, the Lord forgets. That's the difference in divine forgiveness and human forgiveness. You see, when God forgives, He takes sin and He puts it away. He takes our sin and He treats them as if we had never, ever committed them in the first place. 
Now, that is a clear testimony of the Word of God. Now, I'm going to give you some Scriptures, and I'm not going to turn to them uh, because of time, but you can look these Scriptures up for yourself, and it'll tell you exactly what I'm trying to, to, to tell you here. It is a clear testimony of the Word of God that, that God treats us as though we'd never sinned when we come to Him. You can find that in Psalm 103, verse 12. You can find it again in the book of Isaiah, chapter 38, verse uh, 17. You can find it again in the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, verse 25. You can find it again in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 50, verse 20. Is everybody getting these scriptures? Jeremiah, Jeremiah 50, verse 20. Uh, and then in 1 John 1, 7. You see, when John the Baptist testified of Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. But notice what he said after he said that. Which taketh away the sin of the world. He said that over in John chapter 1, Verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Now, the word taketh away means that He carries those sins off. He carries them off. When Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, our sins were laid on Him and He was judged in our place. Uh, well, He was judged where we should have been judged. God judged him as if he was the one guilty of all our sins. God extinguished uh, his wrath in the body of his son when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. Now because our sins have already been paid for, they can also be forgiven and carried away or put away when you and I come to true faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, uh, it's as if our past never occurred. I remember what I've done. How many of you remember what you've done? Yes. I remember what I've done. Satan remembers what I've done. But God don't remember it anymore. You know why? Because it's under the blood. It's under the blood. The blood of the Lamb of God has cleansed it. He's put it away from Him. The Bible says as far as east is to west. Concerning my sin, it's as though it never happened. But then the redeemed, whenever we've been redeemed, it brings us to a place of reconciliation. Now, according to verse 6, the Bible says to praise of the glory of His grace wherein He hath made us accepted, in the beloved. So we've been accepted in the beloved. The word accepted means to make agreeable. When we come to Jesus Christ, you and I are redeemed. So everything changes. All things pass away. Behold, all things get to be new. The old wicked sinner like we used to be has been brought into a grace relationship with God. Our sins are forgiven. Our stains are washed away in His blood. So even in our very nature, the lives that we live, we, we, we begin to change. We've had a new birth. Have you ever noticed somebody's got saved and you notice a change in them? That's because they've got a new nature. They've experienced a, a new birth. Now, God accepts us not as we are in ourselves, but as He has made us in the Lord Jesus Christ. The verb phrase accepted in the beloved is in perfect tense. I could read it this way. I have been accepted. I stand accepted. And I will always be accepted in the beloved. Boy, that's good right there. Knowing that we can always be accepted into the beloved. Now, the result of redemption in our lives, listen, it's eternal. 
Ed, that's why if this body dies, I'll be more alive than I've ever been before in my life. Sitting in the very presence of God. Now this old body of flesh may be dead, but I'm telling you my spirit will be more alive that day than it is right now. So the result of redemption in our lives, it's eternal. It's wonderful. It's glorious. So God is to be praised for the results of His grace and His love in our lives. God, we praise You for Your redemption and the results of Your redemption. Thirdly, God is to be praised for His reasons. And we see His reasons uh, in the rest of the verses that we read to you. Uh, as we think about redemption, the obvious question that we must face is why? Why does God redeem people from their sins? I'm glad God is God. Amen. Have you ever saw anybody that you wouldn't redeem? Don't look at me spiritual. Some of you looking at me spiritual like you had never met anybody like that. I think we all have. I'm glad that God is God. So why does He choose to forgive them and make those kind of people His children? I mean, think about it. Why would God want to just make a drug addict his child? Whenever they just go back to drugging all the time. Why would God want to make an old drunkard his child when they just go back to drinking all the time? Why would God want to make some old pervert his child whenever they just go fall into perversion over and over and over again? Why is God so gracious to people who deserve hell who deserves judgment, and who deserves damnation. Why, why, why? Now the answer to that question are many, and most of them are surrounded in the mystery of God's perfect will. I've been studying God for 40 years or more. And you can put what little bit I know about God in a thimble and shake it up. Y'all know what a thimble is? Y'all know that thing that Granny used to put on the end of her finger whenever she is sewing? People don't use him much anymore. But you could put what little bit I know about him in a thimble and shake it up and there'd still be room to grow. Why? 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 Well, God has a perfect will. These few verses that I read to you, uh, they give some answers to our why questions. Every one of these truths is wrapped up in the wonder of God and who God is. Why does God redeem the lost? Well, God has His reasons. And those reasons cause us to stand in awe and in wonder of His redemptive work. Whenever we begin to look at this, let's talk about the wonder of God's grace. Notice verse 7 again. It says, In whom we have redemption and then it tells us how. According to His riches in grace. Paul tells us that everything that you and I have in the Lord Jesus Christ flows from the bottomless well of His amazing grace. What is grace? Well, you could take grace and you could spell it down in the acrostic. G-R-A-C-E. God. G-R. Redeeming. A. At. C. Christ. E. Expense. God redeeming at Christ's expense. The word grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. It's also been defined as unmerited love. Unmerited favor. Undeserved favor. Now the actual Greek word refers to God's good will, God's loving kindness, God's favor toward us. Grace is any movement of God toward man. 
when the Spirit of God falls in this church, and every now and then it jumps on this preacher. When it jumps on this preacher, it's God moving by His amazing grace. Last Wednesday evening, I walked into this church worn out. And I told Barry, I said, church won't last long this evening because my get up and go has got up and went. I said, so I'm going to be very brief in what I do. And I got up here and glory fell. And all that fatigue just went away. At the end of the service, Barry said, boy, I hope you don't feel good next Wednesday night. He says, we might not ever get out of here. But that's God's amazing grace. Grace is any movement of God toward man. That's why grace is so amazing. And that's why those who receive grace marvel at grace so much. That's why some people stand in wonder and consider God's grace. God in His grace set His love upon us when we didn't deserve to be loved. I know people look spiritual every now and then like we deserved it, but we didn't deserve anything. You got some bones rattling in your closet somewhere. I mean, don't look at me spiritual. I mean, God knows where those bones are. He knows all about those bones. But you see, whenever those are under the blood of Jesus Christ, He don't ever rattle those bones anymore. The problem is you rattle them. And the problem is Satan knows those bones are there too and he rattles them. The biggest problem that most people have with accepting God's forgiveness is they just can't forgive themselves. They just can't forgive themselves. God chose us in the Lord Jesus Christ when He could have condemned us to hell. God reached out to us in love to save us when He had every right to send every person who's ever lived to a devil's hell. That's the wonder of God's grace. And that's why salvation is so special to me. We've been given everything that God has to offer. We didn't deserve anything, but He's given to us everything. We've been brought out of death into everlasting life. I get to thinking about that every now and then. You know, it's not going to be but just a few weeks and we'll be celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, in just a few weeks. We'll be, you know, we call it Easter Sunday. I call it Resurrection Sunday. Amen? It's Resurrection Sunday. It's the Sunday we celebrate Jesus walking out of the tomb. Now, Mart and I, we didn't get to go last year, and I don't know that we're going to plan to go this year, but we love to go to First Baptist Church, Jacksonville, Florida, because they put on the Passion Program. Ed, you and Trish has been down there with us before, and, and, and it is, uh, I mean, it, it is phenomenal. I mean, it is phenomenal. They have, they have a choir probably of about 300 people that sing in background music. They have vocalists there that's on staff. Uh, they've got uh, actors that's putting on the scenes of everything that's taking place. And one of the favorite, one of our favorite scenes is whenever Jesus is supposed to be in the tomb and He walks up there and He just kind of pushes Satan out of the way and grabs those keys and shakes them at Him. Up from the grave, He arose. Up from the grave, He arose. And, and so He's alive. The devil tries to make us think that when we die, that's it. But let me tell you something, that's, that's it. Won't have to worry about being sick no more, that's it. Won't have to worry about going to the doctor no more, that's it. Won't have to worry about oxygen machines no more, that's it. Won't have to worry about heart attacks no more. That's it. Won't need no more knee replacements. That's it. Won't have to have my thumb cleaned out no more. That's it. Won't cough no more. That's it. Amen. 
That's it. That's what it's all about. See, he brings us out of death to everlasting life. We won't have to go to nobody else dying with cancer anymore. We won't have to go to intensive care and visit with none of my church members anymore. Boy, that's going to be wonderful. That's going to be wonderful. You won't have to have, won't be no Cadillacs in heaven. I mean cataracts. <laughs> won't have to worry about that. Amen? And all you folks wearing glasses, won't need them in heaven. You'll have 20 20. Might have 40 40. I don't know. I mean, the Bible says we're going to be like Jesus and he could walk through walls. Y'all know that? He could walk through walls. Man, we're going to, that's life right there. We have been adopted out of Adam into Jesus. We've been delivered from hell and now we are on the road to heaven. Do you want to know? Do you want to know what the wonder of God's grace is? The wonder of God's grace is that He would save the likes of you. The likes of me. Nancy, look at Steve and say, you know you're a wonder. You're a big wonder. <laughs> Marta looks at me all the time and she says, you're a wonder and makes me wonder. Ed, look at Trish and tell her she's a wonder. I can't believe it. <laughs> Barbara, look at Philip and tell him he's a wonder. Oh, she said wonderful. Uh, oh. I went a little too far, Barbara. Isn't that good? That's how much God loves us. Listen. Every soul that is saved is saved because God in order to accomplish His plan, in order to advance His own glory, has revealed the deep things of God unto us. You know why some people can't get saved? Because they just can't understand how simple it is to believe in a God like we serve. They think that they've got to work to get there. They think that they've got to pay their way to get there. And it's freely given. For God so loved the world that He gave. For by grace are you saved through faith. We'll get to that scripture before long. Not of works, lest any should boast. Well, that's good. Verse 8 tells us that God's grace has abounded toward us and that He's given us wisdom and prudence. Now wisdom has the idea, listen, of sanctified knowledge. Ed, next time Trish tells you you don't have good sense, you look at her and you say, honey, I've got sanctified knowledge. That's really deep. <laughs> Tim, Next time Patricia tells you that, you tell her you got sanctified knowledge. Amen. Wisdom is the idea of sanctified knowledge. It is the ability to understand the things of God. The word prudence refers to understanding and insight. Now, it's through wisdom and prudence that God has made known unto us the mystery of His will. You see, God in His grace and for His own glory opened your eyes to the deep things of God. And that's why you're saved by His grace. Because He opened your eyes. He has allowed the redeemed to understand the matters of life and earth. He has allowed us to comprehend heaven. He has allowed us to comprehend hell. He has allowed us to comprehend time. He has allowed us to comprehend eternity. And He has allowed us the depth, the power, and the influence of, that sin once had over us. He's allowed us to have power over that through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's how much He loves us. All of those things were hidden from us who was dead. Look at, look at chapter 2, verse 1. And you have he quickened who were what? 
dead in trespasses and sins. That word quickened means that He's made us alive. Jesus said it this way. In that hour, Jesus, the Bible says, rejoiced in spirit. And listen to what Jesus said. He said, I thank Thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that Thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hath revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. Luke 10, 21. You see, the religious, prudent, and wise of Jesus' day didn't even recognize Him. They didn't. But those people that, those religious, prudent people considered to be ignorant and unlearned they saw Jesus for who He was. Paul said it this way, but as it is written, this is one of my favorite scriptures. Y'all hear me say that a lot, don't you? That's because I love them all, but this is one of my very favorite. Paul said it this way, but as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, Neither is it entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. I like that. Eye has not seen. Ear has not heard. So God, for His own glory and purposes, opened our eyes and He let us see the truth. He used that truth to convict us of our sins and to draw us to the Lord Jesus Christ. He used that truth to give to us faith to believe. He used that truth to redeem us. He makes Himself worthy of our praise because of His grace. Then there's the wonder of His goal. In verse 10. In this verse, Paul reminds us that history is not meaningless or without purpose. God has done everything that He's done to bring everything together in the Lord Jesus Christ. God has determined that He is to be head of all things. Colossians 2.10 Everybody's worried right now about the presidential election. Don't worry. Look at Colossians 2.10. It reminds you that while there may be presidents and earthly kings, one day there's going to be a king of kings who's going to rule over all. And what a day that's going to be. And in that day, everything, Jesus will have first place. You can find that in Colossians 1, 18. One day, the powers that control this world, presidents, kings, one day, they'll all fall at His feet and acknowledge Him to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. One day, Satan will be judged and cast into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. And I'd just like to say, oh, what a day that's going to be. Won't have to worry about temptation anymore. It'll all be gone. Temptation will be gone. Why? Because Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire. One day, Jesus Christ will reign as King of kings and Lord of lords with glory and with power for 1,000 years. This verse speaks of the dispensation of the fullness of time. The word dispensation has the idea of management, oversight, or administration, and it refers to control. One day, 
One day it's going to happen. This verse reminds us that God is still in control of this world. Now there's a lot of men think they are. But God is still in control. He's still working out His perfect plan that He has devised before this world was ever formed. Whenever I see what our country is going through right now, and I read the history of Israel, I see America walking in Israel's footsteps. You ever thought about that? Everything that Israel did in days gone by, we find America doing now. There was a time that Israel said, oh, we don't need God anymore. Right now, there are those who are tooting their horn in America saying, we don't need God anymore. Everything, listen, that takes place is part of God's plan. And one day, God will consummate the plan of Jesus He'll receive the glory and honor and worship that's due Him. And in the end, God will reveal Jesus Christ to be the head of all things to all people. The world acts like He doesn't matter right now. The world refuses to bow down to Him right now. But the Bible says one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. They'll bow down and worship Him. They'll obey Him and they'll love Him. The world appears to be spinning out of control. But this is merely how things appear. Our God is still in control. When the right time comes, He will demonstrate His power through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And here is the wonder of all this. God has made us that are saved by His marvelous grace, part of that plan. Did you hear what I just said? Amen. God's made you part of that plan. Now honey, if I don't get you excited, your wood got wet in all this rain Amen. and just can't catch fire. He has a plan to exalt His Son. He has allowed us to be part of that plan. He has placed us in Jesus Christ by grace through faith. He has blessed us in Jesus Christ with all spiritual blessing. He has promised to keep us, to use us, to allow us to reign with Christ. And these things make Him worthy of all our praise. Look at your neighbor and say, you feel like praising Him now? You feel like praising Him now? You see, in Christ, listen to me, in Christ, you are wealthy. You're wealthy. In Christ, we are wealthy people. All spiritual blessings are ours in Him. And these truths should cause us to bow down before Him with absolute submission to Him. These truths should cause us to worship, to praise, to honor, and to give Him glory for His grace and His gifts that He's given to us. If you are in Jesus, you're giving Him obedience. If you are in Jesus, you're giving Him the reverence that He deserves. If you're in Jesus, you're giving Him the love that's due Him. If you're in Jesus, you're giving Him the worship and praise that He desires and deserves. Now, are you doing your part to accomplish God's plan at exalting the Lord Jesus Christ? Great study of God's precious Word. We'll stop right there. Any comments? Thank God for redemption. Amen? Amen. Thank God for grace, mercy, and salvation. Father, we love You. We thank You for Your Word. Pray that we'll take it out into the world and that it'll not return again into You void. 
But God, that it'll be used where you intend for it to be used, that others can see Jesus. For it's in his name I pray. Amen.